and solitons and nerve signals. We're looking forward to that. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. I got, I got a mail about two years ago from Erio Tosati um, about the tribology conference. I had never heard about that term before in my life. So I didn't know what it is. Now I know it after a few days being here. But I still don't work um, with um, friction so much. Any, but I work with thin layers. Here you see a thin layer, a membrane. Um, it's only about five um, nanometers thick. And I somehow believe that the processes that, that I'm going to describe are more or less frictionless. And uh, maybe you can tell me why that might be so, because most people would affect, expect friction there. But in some sense, I'm a, I'm, I'm a black sheep in a, in a herd of, of, of white sheep that know um, what proper science is. And um, I have refused. Um, to, to do, to include friction in my talk so far. Um, another part of my topic is nerves. <coughs> um, what you see here is um, a, a nerve cell. You see these long cables um, in the nerve cell. Um, and um, these little blobs here, the white lights, they seemingly represent nerve pulses. You see, if you find hundreds of drawings like that on the internet with nerve pulses that are extremely small. However, a typical velocity of a nerve pulse is about um, 100 meters per second in a motor neuron. It lasts a millisecond, and you can easily calculate how long a nerve pulse would be then. So 100 meters per second times um, a one millisecond gives you 10 centimeters. So that means the nerve pulse is actually big, it's macroscopic, and these drawings are all wrong. And um, um, another thing that's important is that this layer is very thin. Um, it, um, the membrane is made out of lipids. Mid lipids have polar head groups and uh, apolar chains. That means they have a, they are thin layer with an insulator in the middle, and um, they therefore form very good capacitors. So that means every kind of deformation that I describe um, in the following um, will also inf affect capacitance of the system and, and cause electrical phenomena in these systems. Okay, um, about a, a few simple facts about um, nerve pulses because I assume that most of you are not familiar with it. Um, first of all, um, the most commonly known um, signal in a nerve is a, is a voltage pulse. So that means that the reason is um, that most people use electrodes to measure a nerve pulse. They don't use thermometers or AFMs to measure that because that's more difficult. And that's why there is this... Um, um, unjustified assumption that a nerve pulse is something electrical. But it is something else happens as well. If, if, you, if you put um, a nerve under an AFM, uh, atomic force microscope, um, without scanning it, just leaving the cantilever on the nerve and then you f let it fire, then you see a dislocation of the order of um, a few angstrom up to um, a nanometer. So, so if you really get a in good contact with a neuron, it's a nanometer. Yeah, so um, a nanometer doesn't sound like very much, but if, 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 if the membrane is only five nanometers thick, it's 20% change in, in, in thickness of the membrane, which is actually a significant signal. Um, uh, one of the more puzzling results is um, that there are temperature changes in there. This has been known since Helmholtz 200 years ago, um, that it is impossible to measure any heat that's dissipated in, these, in, in the nerves during a nerve pulse. So what is measured is temperature goes up and goes back down in exact... Um, um, in, in, um, in, in the same in phase with uh, with, a vo with a voltage change in the system, and if you integrate over the whole uh, heat release um, um, over the complete nerve pulse, you get a heat release at a zero. That means um, would, you would conclude that it is a, a it is an entropy conserving process. So that um, um, means that the nerve pulse seemingly is an adiabatic phenomenon and not a dissipative um, phenomenon. Ph phenomenon. Um, I could. I could talk for, for a long time about um, these heats. Uh, that is, is this um, ab absent of a, of a heat over the nerve pulse has puzzled people for more than 100 years. And there has, ha are many studies that have investigated that. Um, the nerves we work with um, are um, 
partially from lobster. So this is a part of the brain of the lobster that is the first ganglion. There are big, um, um, big strands between those which are um, called this, um, uh, the central nerve. Um, if you you cut the central nerve open with a small pair of scissors, actually a lot of small neurons t um, pop out, and these are um, what we typically consider as nerves. So um, um, this thing is rather a nerve bundle, and most nerves at, and in our body, like the median nerve or uh, the ulnar nerve or so, they are, they are nerve bundles. A single neu a neuron is a part of a nerve bundle. Yeah, so we, we made the AFM experiments that I showed you earlier on this single neuron here. Um, it's very nice for a physicist to have um, such a neuron because it's, it's big enough to, that you can see it with your pure eye. It's about a tenth of a millimeter big. So you see here the scale of the, of the whole thing. Um, so summarizing um, about the property of nerve, you have um, a pulse length of about um, um, a few millimeters to a few centimeters. You have a pulse duration of one to two mo uh, that should be milliseconds. Sorry, that is a mistake in, in my writing. Um, it has a pulse velocity um, of the order of a few meters to 100 meters per second. Um, and it has a diameter uh, ranging from a few micrometer to, um, let's say, a one millimeter in the biggest nerves that I have seen. Um, so you would expect, uh, let's say, our pulses going along the nerve. And in this pulse, a, a number of thermodynamic features of this nerve change, not only voltage, but also, um, but also <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's good to have some music in between. Um, <laughs> um, so, so this pulse represents thermodynamic changes in the membrane and a pulse that is overall adiabatic. So, um, we have a diameter, um, we, we expect curvature in there, and people have for a long time described curvature by uh, elastic theory made by Wolfgang Helfrich in the 1970s. It's one of the most famous works in the membrane biophysics, um, where, you, where you say the free energy density of a membrane um, is quad, has a quadratic dependence on curvature. It's basically Hooke law. Yeah, and, and there is a Gaussian curvature term in there. And you can also stretch the term, um, uh, the, the, the membrane, and you get a quadratic um, dependence on, on, on area in there. This is also just a Hookian um, spring, um, basically. Um, and people assume that these things here, the KB, can bending uh, modulus, or the KG, um, the Gaussian modulus, or here the KTA, that's the isothermal compression modulus, that these are constants. Yeah, they, they are called the elastic constants, and you would assume that, con uh, that constants are constant. Um, and uh, this works fine as long as nothing happens. So people have successfully used this kind of theory to describe vesicular shapes. Um, this is a red blood cell. These are vesicles. These are ki um, one of those is a, is, is a vesicle from, from, from a um, synapse. Um, so you can find from elastic uh, theory shapes of, uh, of um, organelles that are very similar to the calculation, uh, to, to the experimentally found um, shapes. But the problem is, and that is the central part, uh, the central idea of my talk, that in biology, elastic constants are not constant. Yeah, so they are variables, uh, functions. So in order to explain to you why they are not constant, but they depend on some dynamic variables. Um, I have to, to, to go a little bit into what a membrane is and, and how membranes behave. Um, what's very important is the main component of a membrane is a lipid. That, that's how a lipid looks like. So it's a hydrocarbon tail. This is a hydrophilic um, head. And all these things in the membrane here are lipids. And the big blobs in here are some proteins. And, and you have many different lipids in, in this membrane. And how they, how, what the composition is is not really important for me. But the important thing is that they have an ordered transition from an ordered state at low temperature to a disordered state at high temperature. So you get something like a transition. I don't want to call it um, a phase transition in the presence of so many theoreticians. Um, but it's, it, it's a transition, it's an ordered transition, um, which you could call a higher ordered transition from, a, from an order to a disordered state. Um, and you can measure that by measuring the heat capacity. Uh, heat capacity is basically as you heat it up and you measure how much heat um, you need to increase the temperature by a certain amount. 
heat capacities are very, very simple to measure and it's very easy to, 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 to obtain them. So um, you also find, and what I just showed you on the previous slide was a transition of an artificial lipid. But you also find these transitions in biological membranes that's practically unknown. Hardly anybody has co and considers this effect. This, um, this is a melting, the, the, the prof, this heat capacity profile um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in nervous membranes um, from the spine of pigs. Um, this here is from lung surfactant of pigs. I could show you many, many pictures of different bacteria, um, cancer cells, and so on. They all show transitions. It's are the blue peaks in here. And um, then that's it. this here is body temperature. And then you see some other peaks with unfolding of proteins. But the, but the melting of the membranes in the, in, in the biological system happens always slightly below body temperature, such that body temperature is at the upper end of this transition. Now, um, a little bit um, thermodynamics. Um, the, the heat capacity is a change of the enthalpy when you change the temperature. Um, so it's dH dt. The average enthalpy in an ensemble can be just, it's just a weighted average um, of, the, of the microstate states. And this is a norm, normal uh, way of averaging um, a thermodynamic um, extensive variable. And, um, if you now take this average and you make the temperature derivative of it and you calculate a little bit, um, then you find out that the heat capacity is actually equal to the mean square deviation of the enthalpy from the average. So that means it's proportional to the fluctuations. This is called a fluctuations um, uh, relation. Okay, the, um, every single susceptibility is related to a fluctuation relation. And, um, um, capacitance, for example, volume expansion coefficient, um, compressibility, um, dielectric constant, um, they are all susceptibilities um, that you get when you change um, an extensive variable upon changing an intensive variable. So um, the heat capacity is related to fluctuations in enthalpy. So I, to, to give you a kind of um, um, more tr uh, uh, direct um, um, picture of what that means, I show you um, um, what fluctuations are. I mean, you, you are all familiar with fluctuations um, when you have Bra Brownian motion. Yeah, this is basically thermal collisions of, of particles um, with the solvent, and, 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 and it's, this, this just moves around. But in membranes, when they are close to transitions, you also get something like that. On the left-hand side, you see a membrane close to a transition point. And on the right-hand side, you see the transition of this particular lipid. Yes, this is an AFM experiment. And, and, and then underneath, you see a simulation. That's an easing kind um, simulation. And if you run it over time, you see the fluctuations in state. So um, um, the dark colors are the, the ordered state of the lipids. Uh, the, um, the bright colors are the disordered state of the lipid. And you see fluctuation in this system. And the fluctuations, and if you just count the number of, 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 of uh, liquid uh, disordered lipids, um, you would see that this fluctuates around an average. And the mean square deviation of that noise, that is the heat capacity. So the interesting thing is you get the same thing for other um, um, susceptibilities. So, for example, um, compressibility. Um, the, uh, the volume compressibility is given as the, uh, the derivative of the volume with respect to pressure. Now, since the enthalpy here in the, in the exponential term, the Boltzmann term, um, depends on, on, on pressure, um, you can make the same calculations than before, and you find out that the volume compressibility um, is proportional to the fluctuations in volume. Yeah? The same you can do, um, and what you can also do um, by, by using Maxwell relations is to cal calculate the adiabatic um, um, compressibility when you know the isothermal one. So you can do the same trick for area compressibility um, that is proportional to the fluctuations in area. And capacitance is proportional to fluctuations of charges and so on. I mean, um, every single susceptibility is proportional to a fluctuation in some quantity, some extensive quantity. Okay. Now, we have made an experiment um, on membranes where we measured how the volume changes as a function of temperature. So you see two curves here. One of them is the heat capacity, that is a solid line, and the more dashed curve in here is the change of volume with temperature, yeah, measured by a, den den uh, by a densitometer. Um, and what you see this is that these two curves are completely superimposable. So that means volume 
and, uh, and, and, and entropy change in, in an absolutely proportional relation with each other. And you can infer some similar things also for the area. So what you get is um, that the volume change is proportional to the enthalpy change um, and with a kind of coefficient in there which is, happens to have um, a, a number that is very similar to many, many systems that I've investigated. So that means if I know that number, I can calculate um, um, certain things uh, which, and I will show that on the next slide. So what you see here is again the fluctuation relation for the heat capacity, the fluctuation relation for the compressibility, the one for the area compressibility. We know that the volume change is proportional to the enthalpy, the area change is proportional to the enthalpy, and that if we just insert that into this equation, then we see that the compressibility would be proportional to the fluctuations in enthalpy. And that means I can, I can relate um, the compressibility, the volume compressibility, to the fluctuations in enthalpy. And that means um, that the compressibility is proportional to the heat capacity. So that means I can calculate elastic constants from heat capacities in our system. The same thing for the area compressibility. Yeah, so I can calculate those um, from um, um, the heat capacity. Um, now, um, I told you already um, that I can um, also determine um, the, the adiabatic compressibility. That's important because um, it is part of the sound velocity. If you, if you try to measure sound propagation in a system, um, the sound velocity would be equal to the square root of 1 over the compressibility times the, the density. And um, now I told you I can calculate all of these things from the heat capacity. I've done that here. That would be the sound velocity as a function of temperature. And the dots are experimental points um, that um, people have measured in, in Göttingen with, um, with an ultra ultrasonic resonator. Yeah, so that means you can successfully predict um, um, the, the compressibility and the sound velocity um, in um, experimental systems. Um, another thing that one can do that has something, also something to do with the fluctuations is that um, you can um, determine the lifetime of the fluctuations. The lifetime of the fluctuation is um, the same as the relaxation lifetime, and you can prove that the lifetime of fluctuations is proportional um, to the amplitude of the fluctuations and um, um, will um, uh, yield something which is known as critical slowing down. That means if you are in, it, in the transition, the process is slow, and it turns out in uh, just this is experimental data and, and the other curve is the heat capacity profile that you can calculate um, the relaxation time scale by, um, um, by um, well, you find that it's proportional um, within experimental accuracy to the heat capacity. So you can also um, determine the lifetimes from that. That is because we have a system here that has basically only one single order parameter and all, all fluctuations turn out to be proportional to each other. That has... Um, so, in the following, we take it as an experimental fact that the elastic constants are proportional to the heat capacity. The relaxation lifetime is proportional to the heat capacity, and everything that changes um, the heat capacity will change the elastic constants and the lifetime. So that means I can manipulate um, all these properties by changing um, the, um, the, uh, the thermodynamic variables, for example, pressure or temperature or something like that. Now, I want to present you um, this set of data that I had before in a slightly different way. Rather than plotting um, the sound velocity as a function of temperature, I want to, pl to, to, um, to um, plot the square of the sound velocity as a function of density. And what you see, but these are basically the same data, just presented in a different way. Yeah, so that means here, this, this would be um, the temperature in which a biological membrane is slightly above a transition, it's a, with the lowest density. And then when you go up um, in density, that means you compress a membrane and you make it more solid. Yeah. Then the, uh, the, um, uh, the sound velocity goes down because the compressibility goes up. It's a very strange kind of spring. We have a spring that when we compress it becomes softer. Yeah, because we move the spring into a, into a regime where the fluctuations are high. Um, and, um, so, um, and now I can make a statement about sound propagation in the system. Um, the, the wave equation for propagating of sound is 
um, is given here. That is just um, um, standard um, hydrodynamics. Um, that um, the, the second derivative of, of, of the density with respect to time is proportional to um, the derivatives with respect to space, and this, the sound velocity is in the bracket term here. Yeah. And we can sort of try to approximate this density dependence of the sound velocity with a, with a Taylor expansion. So we have a constant term, a linear term, a quadratic term, and so on. And I will use that and insert that into the wave equation. And that's what you see here. Then the wave equation looks like this. So you have instead of sound velocity squares, you have a constant term, a linear term, a quadratic term as a function of density. We have added a second term in there, which is called the dispersion term that takes into account um, that uh, um, density is also frequency dependent. Uh, sorry, the sound velocity is also frequency dependent. The interesting thing is this equation has um, um, analytical solutions, which are solitonic. It's a soliton. It's um, in contrast to the talks this morning. It's not a topological soliton, but a, just a normal one, like like in water. I show you that in the moment. But it's remarkable that this soliton, that is the solution of this equation, has is very very similar to the nerve pulse. So it has a, 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 a maximum amplitude of about one nanometer. It has a velocity. Um, that is um, about two-thirds of the sound velocity in a membrane, which is approximately 100 meters per second, like in motor neurons. Um, it has, a, uh, since it's an adiabatic process, it, has a re it, it first releases heat and reabsorbs it in the second phase. And there are many, many other um, things that are um, um, remarkable effects. So these things, these things are um, experimental profiles. This is a soliton, um, that, which is a solution to this equation. So I, I said these things already, um, and we have uh, 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 um, uh, nerve pulse approxim uh, travel approximately the speed of sound, so it terms associated with sickness changes in the membrane, they are adi adiabatic, and this is all remarkably similar to the nerve pulse. To show you what a soliton is, um, I show you this, um, this video from the internet. Um, this is uh, the famous um, John Scott Russell's um, soliton from 1834. It's basically a propagating water pulse. You get these solutions to, um, um, to the propagation equation when you have shallow water. In deep water, you get just sinusoidal waves, as usual, but in shallow water, you get a, a single pulse that per pulse um, uh, makes elastic co collisions. Um, it is reflected from walls, and so on, and it, 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 it propagates without much dissipation. So um, when did I start? I started approximately... Okay, um, so um, now, now this equation that I just showed you um, has four parameters. That is these three, which come from the experimentally measured sound velocity, and the dispersion term, which is just a constant that determines how broad the pore peak is. And it's a little bit ugly that one um, that I, that we have not exp uh, explained the dispersion dispersion term um, 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 so far. But that I do here. Um, I've shown you that um, uh, the, the relaxation time in membranes is proportional to the heat capacity, and um, that may, uh, and um, we also find that the heat capacity is frequency dependent. Right, that has something to do with the relaxation process in, in, in the system. And by using linear response theory, we can actually, we actually find out that the dispersion coefficient is also a function of density, and we can calculate it from the thermodynamic properties of the membrane. So we can then get a dispersion coefficient, which is not a constant, but it's a profile like this as a function of density, and you get solitons that, um, that look like that, um, and, and, and the, the different shapes that you see there depend on how fast they travel and how much energy they, um, um, they have. But we have now a, a theory for the propagation of sound in, in, in biological membranes, which, is come, which can be um, found without any free parameter. All the information is the thermodynamic information about the phase transition of that system. Um, good. Um, so... These solitons, um, um, so we basically claim that these solitons are the nerve pulse. Um, everything that can, um, um, that can move the, uh, the membranes through a transition would be able to excite a soliton. Everything that moves the transition away from physiological temperature would inhibit uh, the excitation of a nerve pulse. 
So the, the things that can excite a nerve pulse would be voltage, a, a, a increase in pressure, a, temperature, a local temperature decrease, and so on. Inhibition vision could be a temperature increase, um, anesthetics, um, but also changes in pH and things like that. Good. So now what is that good for? Um, we have um, here, I show here the transition in the biological membrane again. Here is um, the melting point of the membrane. This is physiological temperature. So now the claim is everything that moves the transition to the right side would make the nerve more excitable. Everything that moves it to the left side makes it uh, less excitable. Um, so we can, um, by controlling the transition, we can control um, um, the physiological function of the nerve. And we can now check whether that is true. Um, one remarkable thing um, about um, anesthesia is um, that all anesthetics um, at critical dose of, the, of anesthesia have exactly the same concentration in a membrane. So it's completely in, unspecific, doesn't depend on chemistry whatsoever. Um, and um, one can explain that by a simple um, um, law from Van Toft, that's the freezing power and depression law, um, that, that basically says that the, that the depression of a melting point by, uh, by dissolving a substance in the liquid phase is exactly proportional to the amount of substance. And that is exactly found um, in the experiment. So if, if um, you add anesthetics, I added here octanol, but I can and here uh, lidocaine, which is a local anesthetic. If you add that to, I'm nearly finished. Um, and if you add that to membranes, um, then you um, um, lower the melting point. And this here is the ca calculated by assuming the melting point depression law. This here is the experiment. Um, the interesting thing is that there are other variables that shift transitions in the opposite direction, like pressure. So if anesthetics shifted downwards and pressure shifted upward, what happens if you do both things at the same time? Do, can you wake up somebody? By, um, who's anesthetized by applying pressure. And that people, ha people have actually measured that in tadpoles. And if you um, apply pressure on anesthetized tadpoles, they in fact wake up at, at pressures that can be predicted from the numbers that I've shown you before. There are other phenomena that make sense in that sense. For example, if you stretch a nerve, yeah, that means you, you, you have, have a, a tension in the membrane that would move transitions to lower temperatures, and that would um, make um, the, um, the action potentials smaller because you need a larger energy to excite them. And that is um, what um, the calculation says. This is what you find in an experiment. You, when you stretch a nerve, the action potential, in fact, gets smaller. Another effect um, is tremor. Yeah, if you shake, um, and you assume that shaking, um, if nerves shake, they, they are overexcitable, meaning that the transition is at a slightly high, too high temperature, yeah? then um, um, anesthetics should work against tremor. And that's actually something where you find a lot of literature about, um, that uh, people with essential tremor basically stop shaking when they drink a glass of wine. Yeah? And I, um, I, there, I had a student in one course who explained that to me, and I found that very interesting. Um, another student in one of my courses um, actually had bipolar order, disorder um, treated by lithium. Um, lithium is a very strong binder to charges, nearly like calcium, but much stronger than cal um, potassium or sodium, and that um, um, increases transition temperature. So an overdose of lithium also causes tremor, and that be can be counteracted by, um, by anesthetics. So I come to my summary slide. I could I could could talk for 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 hours about phenomena like that, but there's it, it, it it's a powerful approach, right? It, it has a lot of predictive power, and, and some of the phenomena can be predict, predicted in numbers. Um, so um, the nerve pulse can be understood as an electromechanical soliton. You find the right velocity and amplitude. Um, this is a consequence of the nonlinear elastic properties close to melting transitions. Um, this is consistent with reversible heat production and the adiabatic nature of the pulse, and there are absolutely no free parameters um, in there. Um, and there exist numerous medical conditions that can be associated to the shift in the melting transition, and that makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for this f physical view into biological membranes. Uh, very fascinating. Ariel has some questions. What about... Uh what about the electrical signal and the depolarization wave and the whole classical story? 
Yeah, well, I, I talked um, in my talk mainly about volume and area changes, um, but of course you also have membrane polarizations. You have um, you have the capacitance of the membrane. Of course, if you have a, the soliton consists on the, uh, of a region where the membrane becomes thicker because you move it through the transition. That changes the capacitance by uh, by by twenty percent, and you get capacitive currents, for example. You also get a change in voltage. You get a reduction in voltage when you do that. No, I wouldn't call it a side effect. In thermodynamics, all effects are true effects that are coupled with each other. But, but um, when I discuss with people from the neuroscience field, they often call the mechanical effects side effects, which is also wrong. Um, these are all effects that are equally important. I'm, I'm wondering, uh, what is the role of ion channels in all of that? So w would these nerve pulses propagate even without ion channels? Yes. So is there a role of ion channels at all? Or they I don't useless? know, but, 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 the, but the thing is, I don't have that on my slide here. But um, I, 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 I could show that I, to you in the coffee break. In, in the regime where the membrane fluctuates a lot, and when you then make a patch clamp experiment and you measure the current through the membrane, you get events which are fluctuations in the, in the permeability which look exactly like ion channels. So all these phenomena like ion channel opening and closing is also a consequence of the thermodynamics. Can you open the chat? Who's the host? Uh, there was oh. a question online. Can, uh, whoever put the hand up, can you unmute yourself and... Yes, yes. So uh, it's a related question. I'm definitely not an expert on the subject, but is there an explanation here for the refractory period? Why, why you know, after a pulse has passed, there would be a time before, uh, before which it can... It can, it can generate and, and transmit a pulse? Well, at least there's something that is similar to a refractory period because in order to get a soliton, you must accumulate material from the side. So that means two, two solitons that are close to each other compete for material. And there is a kind of um, uh, uh, minimum distance that you get between two solitons in order to have mass conservation in the system. Okay, so because we have to do our schedule today for the next post session in time, thank you very much indeed. So, uh, yeah, applause for our speaker. We are meeting again at 4.40, yeah, 20 before the hour. And please come back a little bit earlier and meet our...